The BBC journalist who broke the story about a police investigation into Sir Cliff Richard has denied that he coerced the police into telling him about the raid on the singer's home. In court, he also said that it was his BBC bosses that made decisions about the singer's privacy when deciding to cover the story in 2014. Sir Cliff is suing the BBC over its coverage of a police investigation into an allegation of sexual assault, about which he was never arrested nor charged. Our special correspondent Lucy Manning was in court. <laughs> Look who's here. Hello. Sir Cliff Richard, with his friend Gloria Honeford alongside him, heard the journalist who reported the police investigation into him strongly defend his right to run the story. What is the latest there, Dan? Well, the police search is still going on here. Dan Johnson was praised by his bosses for this reporting. They called it a gold-plated scoop. The story, he explained in court, wasn't about Sir Cliff Richard being guilty, but about the police investigation. And he claimed, although it could be damaging, it doesn't mean we don't have the right to tell people what the police were doing. Sir Cliff Richard's barrister questioned why Mr Johnson had felt the need to report the allegation against the singer at all. He said, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to conclude this looks like potentially a pretty flimsy complaint, do you? Mr Johnson replied, I'm not Sherlock Holmes, I'm not the police, that's their job. But given that they had decided to take this forward, to take it seriously, to take it to the next stage, I couldn't just ignore what they were doing. The BBC was criticised for using a helicopter to film the search of his flat. Mr Johnson claimed issues about Sir Cliff Richard's privacy were considered by those higher up, his bosses in London. Mr Johnson claimed this was a story involving allegations of a serious nature against a figure of the highest profile, against the backdrop of a number of other allegations being made against celebrities, some having been jailed guilty as a result of other victims coming forward because of media coverage in some instances. Mr Johnson was asked about remarks he'd made about a Billy Graham religious rally, which is where the allegation about Sir Cliff Richard was said to have happened. The reporter wrote an email saying it wasn't just the hand of God doing the touching. Sir Cliff Richard shook his head as Mr Johnson denied he'd been treating the singer as a guilty man. Still now, I will literally have people that will come to my surgeries and end up in tears when they're reliving that day. You know, they went there, this isn't some mass riot that was going on. This was a sunny day and people going there with their families to protest what they felt was an unjust situation.
policemen fought with truncheons under a barrage of stones and missiles. By mid-morning, the picketing had turned to rioting. After two hours, the police were tired of being pushed and pelted with house bricks. The pickets knew what to expect. They'd been warned it could turn nasty, and it did. Police officers have claimed that the South Yorkshire force told them what to write in statements they made during the miners' strike in 1984. Officers have told the BBC's Inside Out programme that statements were at least partially dictated after the fierce clashes between miners and police at the Orgreave Coakworks near Sheffield. Dan Johnson reports. It was the most violent confrontation of the miners' strike. 10,000 pickets against 5,000 police. We got hold of around a hundred police statements from Orgreave and officer after officer from forces across the country used the same phrases over and over again.
We showed them to an independent Sheffield barrister. When you put their statements literally side by side, you can see that their statements begin in an absolutely identical fashion. 31 officers from four different forces used the phrase, as we stood there in the line, a continuous stream of missiles came from the pickets into the police line. You can't get statements written in the way that they have been done here and find such a degree of similarity between their statements without uh, there being some degree of collusion. Hillsborough and the cover-up that followed are being investigated by the Independent Police Complaints Commission. There are now growing calls for a re-examination of police conduct over Orgreave. South Yorkshire Police wouldn't give us an interview, but they say they're not aware of any concerns being raised by the judge at the original trial. They say they'll now consider whether any review is necessary. Dan Johnson, BBC News, Sheffield. Well, viewers in Yorkshire and Lincolnshire can see the full story tonight. It's on Inside Out at 7.30 on BBC One. It's going to be available everywhere else on the BBC iPlayer. We're at Orgreave, scene of the bitter battle during the miners' strike in 1984. Of course, there are two accounts of what happened that day, one from the miners, one from the police. Our man Dan Johnson has uncovered evidence which suggests that the police doctored statements. And that could have led to the culture which five years later on would see the cover-up at Hillsborough. On the face of it, there seems little connection between the minor strike of the 1980s and what happened on the Leppings Lane Terrace. But tonight, we'll reveal how Hillsborough, far from being an isolated event, was in fact part of a pattern of senior South Yorkshire police officers manipulating the statements made by junior officers. And while Hillsborough resonated around the world, what happened at Orgreave in June 1984 has been left as a footnote in history. It's not so long ago that Yorkshire was synonymous with mining. Before the 1984 strike, this region was dotted with 60 collieries, each of them supporting a community and giving thousands of Yorkshire miners jobs. The strike was the turning point for the industry. 
The miners, led by Arthur Scargill, believed that the government planned to shut down hundreds of pits. Faced with the loss of their jobs, most Yorkshire miners came out on strike. The most notorious flashpoint was the Orgreave coking plant on the outskirts of Sheffield. The coke it produced powered the British steel mill at Scunthorpe. During the 1972 miners' strike, the National Union of Mine Workers had famously shut the Saltley coking plant in Birmingham by sending in flying pickets. Arthur thought what we should really do is to have a one big pitch battle uh, like the one he had at Saltley Gate. In Saltley Gate, we won. Saltley acted as a template for the picketing at Orgreave 12 years later. Only this time, the miners faced a police force and a government determined not to be beaten. Over the weeks, tension grew and things finally came to a head on June the 18th. That day, around 10,000 pickets turned up. There to try and stop them shutting the plant were at least 5,000 policemen from many different forces across the country. The miners' strike is a hundred days old tomorrow and today brought the worst scenes of violence of the dispute. The violence lasted most of the day. By the end of it, 93 miners had been arrested. According to the official police report, 51 pickets were injured along with 72 police officers. But as with Hillsborough, two very different accounts of what had happened emerged. We were like um, a phalanx of, of Roman legionnaires lined across the field. Obviously the coke lorries are coming through, infuriating uh, the, the pickets, and so the level of missiles appeared to increase. Police horses were deployed, and then um, on the date in question, um, decision was taken, we were taken from long shields uh, and told we were to deploy as short shield snatch squads. It was like a military plan and when miners arrived on June, you know, sunshine, bare chested and they've been picketing there for weeks and weeks, they expected it to be kind of the same ritual, you arrive and the police are there in a great long line and we push against it for 30 seconds and then it's sort of over with really and the lorries go into the coking works. Over the weeks, tension grew and things finally came to a head on June the 18th. It was like a military plan and when miners arrived on June, you know, sunshine, bare chested and they've been picketing there for weeks and weeks, they expected it to be kind of the same ritual, you arrive and the police are there in a great long line and we push against it for 30 seconds and then it's sort of over with really and the lorries go into the coking works. The pickets were penned in away from the front entrance, but when the first convoy was spotted at around 9 o'clock, the trouble began. The pickets surged and running fights broke out. Missiles were thrown and fencing ripped up. But when the smoke bombs went off, the reinforcements and the riot shields moved in. And all the while, the lorries, 35 of them, swept in procession into the plant. The injuries were to both pickets and police, the victims taken away to waiting ambulances. An hour and 20 minutes later, the newly laden lorries left for Scunthorpe, their drivers well protected in their cabs. This time, the miners, helpless behind the police cordon, stood and watched in almost total silence. This afternoon, another convoy and more clashes as police drove back pickets, and again, running battles between miners and mounted police. There were more injuries, ambulance men wore special headgear as they led casualties away from the scene.
The mounted police then escorted reinforcements as the picket lines grew. By this stage, missiles, including pieces of fencing, were being thrown at the police. More arrests followed, and the injuries, pickets as well as policemen. More than 30 people were hurt. But the convoy got into the plant, and while Mr. Scargill organized his demonstration, it was loading up, and it soon left again. This afternoon, more missiles were aimed at the police as the second convoy of lorries prepared to leave. While special helmeted ambulance men tended the injured, mounted police were chasing pickets who'd broken away and who tried to approach the plant from the back. But by mid-afternoon, the second convoy emerged and another load of 800 tonnes of coke was on its way to the Scunthorpe Steelworks. Mr. Scargill's plan had failed, but the confrontations here, it seems, will continue. Michael Macmillan, ITN, Sheffield. Arthur Scargill arrested and there's more violence. The police say enough is enough. Mrs Thatcher says it's mob rule. Good evening. Violence on the miners' picket lines reached a new level today. This morning Arthur Scargill was arrested outside the Orgreave coking plant. This afternoon there were more clashes there and the police said it wasn't a picket, it was a riot. They said they'd never seen anything like it. It was the second day of violence in South Yorkshire. Mrs Thatcher said there was an attempt to substitute mob rule for the rule of law. The NUM is planning a mass lobby of Parliament next week, but tomorrow there's another attempt to find a way to end the strike. Secret talks between miners' leaders and the coal board. Mr Scargill had appeared in court this afternoon. He was released on bail after denying a charge of obstruction. James Robbins reports on his arrest and what followed. 7.40 this morning at Orgreave. Arthur Scargill appeared, heading a column of miners. Their president wanted to stop well short of the area where the police intended to confine the pickets, and he stood his ground. The strike was the turning point for the industry. The miners, led by Arthur Scargill, believed that the government planned to shut down hundreds of pits. Faced with the loss of their jobs, most Yorkshire miners came out on strike. The arrest of the miners' leader provoked no significant trouble during the rest of the morning, but peace quickly evaporated in a very hot afternoon with the arrival of the second of today's convoys to collect coke for British Steel at Scunthorpe. The pickets were without their leader and they were getting angry. There were many fewer miners than yesterday, but they seemed really determined to get to the lorry drivers they so hate. At one stage it seemed the police line might break. Reinforcements were ordered and brought up, and then they charged. The horses were sent in and the situation quickly broke down. The police say they were forced to charge, but the miners alleged deliberate aggression and brutality as they were gradually driven away from the coking plant. But from the pickets there was concerted stone throwing and a new heavy weapon, a telegraph pole intended to roll onto the police lines. Then a hint of fresh tactics copied from Northern Ireland. A portable cabin thrown across the road by miners and set alight as a barricade. Something the miners didn't want us to film. The police were now calling this a riot. And they reacted by calling up hundreds of extra men. Fresh men for a series of renewed charges.
In the crush, it was inevitable that some of those caught in the middle would get injured. Most of those hurt were pickets. Some of them were brought out unconscious, and at least one was given the kiss of life by a policeman. One picket suffered a fractured skull. Twenty police and pickets needed treatment. Three are still in hospital. Then, with stones being thrown by some pickets from the back, the situation became much worse as some police tried to make arrests. It was indeed like a battlefield with anger and real fear on both sides. As the foot police withdrew to their original line, their mounted colleagues went in and scattered the pickets. The police then moved forward again to clear the area, but the miners had already pulled back several hundred yards. During the day, which produced some of the ugliest scenes of the dispute so far, a total of 19 arrests were made. It was a day of violence much regretted by both sides, but which did nothing to heal the rift between them. This afternoon, another convoy left the works, but only a handful of miners had stayed to jeer the police and then leave themselves without more trouble. Jeremy Hands, News at 10, Orgreave, South Yorkshire. A policeman who gave the kiss of life to an injured picket said afterwards he thought the man was dead. Sergeant George Watson had to try three times before he could get the man breathing again. He said it was deplorable that while police helped the injured, the pickets continued to throw stones. The pickets later denied that any missiles were thrown. Media and police will have people believe that miners were rioting and throwing masses of bricks and lumps of concrete at police. It won't like that in slightest. I was there, and only incident to me that occurred was a ritual push. It was a push between pickets and police, and it happened on every picket line. Only people that rioted that day were police. They went berserk. There was an understanding and acceptance that protest was their lawful and legal right, um, but these idiots who um, wanted to use the police as Aunt Sally's, the, the anonymity that their numbers gave them caused the problem. It started with um, just a general pushing and shoving, and it was fairly much okay. And then it, it started to escalate where one or two bricks and bottles came across. So that charge by the horses then, Norman, did you think that was justified by the level of violence that you were encountering? I was a bit surprised to see the horses, but quite pleased, because it stopped the, uh, the bricks being thrown. You know, if the horses are coming charging towards me, swinging them big nightsticks, I might be built like Gandhi, but I'm not going to sit down in the road singing, we shall overcome, baby, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so, of course we launched bloody bricks at them to try and stop the charge. What's happened now is that the police force has uh, dramatically changed its composition and become a, a national police force under nobody's direction other than the, um, the heads of the police in, in, in Scotland Yard and of course the Prime Minister directly. Um, what's happened um, 
by, uh, by the stroke of somebody's pen is that a political police force has been created in Britain. It's just I've got the right shields. I've got the right shields there. And you've got to push on. There's no bricks being thrown out and you've got to, uh, and I've seen it, you've got to push on. And all of a sudden there's arms coming up at top of the trunjons, whack, whack, mm -hmm. up at top of the right, right well, when, when we put the push on and I was in front line, I was dragged through, I mean there's about that, five rows of cars at Allgrave, I was dragged through, there was no stones, no bricks, no nothing being used. And as a turn man I saw a lad, and this was a chief filth, one with all the braiding on, holding him by his hair, while one of, the, one of his little comrades were smacking him in the comrades. face. So his head couldn't go back, so he could just take the full wallop of the fist line. Next thing I knew, I was down on the deck. I was booted, thumped, truncheon by God knows how many coppers, and when they finished with me, they kicked me down an embankment and then they set two dogs on me. For 95 days, our lads had been beat, beaten up, kicked, truncheoned by the police from Ravenscraig all the way down to Coventry and further, well, some of them had had enough. Of course, they started fighting back. Anybody with blood in the veins would fight back. These days, Michael Mansfield's one of Britain's most famous defence barristers. In 1984, he represented several miners in the first Orgreave trial, which took place in Sheffield in 1985. The video footage that the police themselves took showed a completely different story, not the one the BBC put out, but the police footage was quite different. There were a lot of independent monitors, some with notebooks, some with cameras, and one with a movie camera stuck up a tree. The, the police had no idea the extent to which what they were doing, their unlawful activities, were being filmed. So, if you put the combination of that package together, you had a record, a, a really almost unchallengeable record, of a completely different version of events. so the level of missiles appeared to increase, police horses were deployed and When we queried police tactics, we were simply told that anyone who challenges the government or badmouths the police is the enemy within. By 7 a.m., 4,000 miners were at Orgreave waiting for the coke lorries to arrive. Police had been expecting them. They equaled the number of pickets. When the lorries came an hour later, the miners' ranks had swelled to more than 5,000. 
As the last lorry went in, the trouble started. Pickets charged straight into the police riot shields. In seconds, a pack of police 20 deep was fighting a shower of stones to hold the pickets back. The first cavalry charge came a few minutes later, and it clearly worried the pickets. More police reinforcements, this time taking advantage of the confusion caused by the horses. As the horses came back, pickets threw half bricks at them. Then they started on the front line of police. Some of the pickets had wrenched riot shields away from the front line. When they started to gather for another push, the second wave of mounted police went in, scattering the pickets right across the field. Tension built up. The assistant chief constable warned the pickets to stop throwing missiles and disperse. They didn't. More reinforcements, this time with short shields and truncheons. After two hours, the police were tired of being pushed and pelted with house bricks. The pickets knew what to expect. They'd been warned it could turn nasty, and it did. There were many injuries on both sides. More than a hundred pickets were arrested. Get in there and see what they're doing. In the afternoon, there were more injuries and arrests as police drove the pickets back up a hill away from the coking plant. Cars from a nearby scrapyard were overturned and set alight to stop the police advance. <laughs> no way is this picketing. Um, the miracle is that no one has been killed here today, either by being trampled on in the surges or struck by some of these enormous bricks that have been thrown, half house bricks and that sort of thing. Uh, you obviously saw the barrage coming over and the shields were taking the full weight of those things. Without those shields being there, there would have been a lot of policemen in hospital. Some pickets laid the blame for the violence elsewhere. We deplore the people that thrown the bricks. We deplore them. We want you arrested, because they're no miners. They're only agitators. Young communists in the lot. We deplore them. We're here to be a peaceful picket. Okay. Nothing else. I accept that, my old son. Okay. okay. Don't have to well, done. fair enough. Well, the debris remains, but Orgreave is now quiet. Tomorrow, thousands of policemen will once more be drafted in from many parts of Britain. Phil Roman, News at 10, South Yorkshire. At first, police horses tried to shepherd the miners out of the convoy road. The violence reached a new peak as miners surged forward against the riot shields. Policemen fought with truncheons under a barrage of stones and missiles. By mid-morning, the picketing had turned to rioting. The police hadn't lost ground, but more riot squads were needed as reinforcements in the front line as the pressure increased. Eventually, senior officers ordered in the mounted police to disperse the miners. A gap opened and the horses galloped in. Police horses are the most feared weapon in the present armoury. But it's the riot squads that follow up to make the arrests. And today, 
On the fields around Orgreave, the police became involved in some of the most vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting of the entire miners' dispute. The attacks on individual policemen were horrific. The police commanders said it was a marvel that no one was killed. The battle lasted throughout the morning, and in all, police made over a hundred arrests as the scuffles ebbed and flowed. At all times, the police were in control, but under tremendous pressure. There was never anything peaceful about the frontline confrontation. It appeared to be a conscious decision to use any method to stop the Coke lorries. By late afternoon, Rotherham Hospital had handled 63 patients, pickets and policemen, but only four had been detained, one of them Arthur Scargill, the miners' president. He'd been using a two-way radio to keep in touch with the pickets. Mr Scargill claimed he'd been knocked down by a police riot shield. He fell from that bank, um, slipped more than fell, and his back sort of hit the ground and the back of his head hit what I think is an old railway sleeper. Mr Scargill says that he was hit by a riot shield from behind. He wasn't near a riot shield. The riot shields were on the road and Arthur Scargill, together with two other men, who I can identify, were on the bank to the left of that road. They were five or six feet above the road. But the rioting continued despite the injuries and arrests. Whole roadways were strewn with the debris of demolished stone walls. A burning barricade had been built against the police horses. But the two convoys still got away unmolested behind the vigilant guard of a huge body of weary policemen. I think the allegation is that we had statements dictated to us or something similar. Um, I was not dictated to with regard to the statement, but some of the, some of the statements in public order situations can seem formulaic. So where officers, uh, or in my statement it talks about I was frightened, I was apprehensive, etc. Those are the forms of words that you use because in terms of the Public Order Act, or it's actually common law then, that, those are the things you express. In 1985, the first 15 miners charged with riot were put on trial here at the old Sheffield Crown Court. But the case collapsed after 16 weeks in spectacular style when it became clear the police evidence wasn't reliable. One officer 
PC Stephen Hill said under cross-examination that much of his statement had been narrated to him. PC Hill's version of events tallies with former Inspector Norman Taylor's recollection of what happened when he was asked to write up his statement. I mean, it was like a big room, people, there were different parts of the room. And I, I recall this uh, policeman in plain clothes uh, mentioned that we were, he'd, he'd had a good idea of the, what had happened and we were from different police forces and that uh, there was a preamble to set the scene and he was reading from uh, some paper, a paragraph or so, and he asked the people to use that as their starting paragraph. So you copied down what he told you to write? So that paragraph, I think, was basically the time and date, the name of the place. There were guys from the Met who hadn't a clue where South Yorkshire was. In fact, it was more than just one paragraph. The arresting officers may have thought they were simply describing the scene at Orgreave, but why did South Yorkshire detectives dictate a form of words to the officers? It seems clear the fact that the exact same phrases appeared in dozens of statements was no coincidence. To take just one example, 31 officers from four different forces used this identical phrase. As we stood there in the line, a continuous stream of missiles came from the pickets into the police line. There were no shields being used at this point. We got hold of around 100 police statements from Orgreave and what you find in them is fascinating. Officer after officer from forces across the country used the same phrases over and over again. So was it the intention of the police from the start to build an exaggerated case of riot against the pickets? Exactly the we took the Orgreave statements to a leading Sheffield barrister to ask for an independent opinion. It's very obvious in the Orgreave cases that there was widespread collusion. Um, you can't get statements written in the way that they have been done here uh, by police officers from different forces involved in different arrests and find such a degree of similarity between their statements without uh, there being some degree of collusion. I've just taken one of a number of examples. This is a West Yorkshire police officer uh, who's involved in a separate arrest, nothing to do with this South Yorkshire officer. But when you put their statements literally side by side, you can see that their statements begin in an absolutely identical fashion. On Monday, the 18th of, On June, Monday, 18th 1984, of June, 1984, you've got the setting of the scene here as to the date. This passage here... Eventually, eventually the pickets were the repelled were and they retreated. And they there was, however, a continual was a barrage continual of missiles. Barrage exactly of the missiles. same in the two statements. That's word for word. Absolutely. And then here, an interesting phrase, periodically there were missile throwing from the back of the picket ranks. Uh, but apart from this, there was no trouble. Now, uh, some other statements have the first part of that, but li leave out that second bit. But there are uh, literally several dozen examples of, of police officers who have used exactly the same phrase there. It's obviously difficult because of the lapse of time. It's now getting on for 30 years since Orgreave. But the fact remains that if there is evidence that senior police officers in the South Yorkshire Police did apparently uh, conspire together, and this would have been a, it couldn't have happened just on, I would have thought, one officer say so. If there's evidence of a conspiracy to pervert the course of justice, then in principle, why should they be allowed to live out their retirements on their uh, pensions uh, with immunity?